what happens on the walk to school? Do you remember your walk to school? Do you remember the long road stretching out in front of you? Do you remember the friends that you shared the journey with? Do you remember bags that were simply way too heavy? You never thought you were going to make it. You just weren't simply going to get home. Do you remember the adventures that sometimes ended wrong? Well, I'd like to propose that this journey, this walk to school, in fact mattered. Remember that it took you 15 minutes to get to school, but an hour and a half to get home? Well, that hour and a half mattered. That hour and a half mattered to your sense of self. It mattered to your health. It mattered to your understanding of the world. And it probably even shaped your world view. And here is why. Walking is, in fact, an indicator of us as a species. It tells us something about who we are and what it is that we, in fact, value. Now, uh, you'll see here on this next slide, uh, this is a picture of me walking to school. You can tell it's a classic 70s shot. Uh, this is the late 70s. And I always thought that some kind of adventure was going to take place while I was walking to school. I was out in the world. I was making choices. Today, we have to ask, what has happened to this free, simple adventure that we offer children? Are children out in the world today taking chances? seeking simple pleasures as they walk home from school. Well, let's see what's happened. If you look at this graph here, and I'm an urban planner. We like graphing things and mapping things out. And I work in communities across Canada. And one of the things that you see on this graph is really reflective of what's happening on a national and, quite frankly, a continental scale in this country. And it's an inversion. In 1969, the odds are you walked to school. 12% of the population in 1969 was driven to school. In 2009, the odds are that your child is driven to school. 12% of the population in 2009 walks to school. In one generation, we have completely inverted the way we move about. What does this mean? And really, does this even matter? Well, I would like to propose that it matters for three not-so-frivolous reasons. And the first reason is that walking to school is, in fact, a rite of passage. And this is about childhood autonomy. There is some wonderful literature that talks about autonomy and the role that autonomy plays for children in creating autonomous adults. And we have to ask ourselves, has the wholesale abandonment of the walk to school, is it, in fact, a risk to us as a society? Now, you saw the picture of me walking to school as a child. I was very exuberant, obviously. Um, and I can easily be nostalgic about walking to school. But I also remember, I remember the rain. I remember coats that were too thin. I remember shoes that got soggy. I remember carrying a brown paper bag with my lunch in it. No one carries those anymore, but I remember carrying that in the rain, the bag getting wet, the bag breaking, and the apples tumbling down onto the street out of my arms and having to somehow figure out how I was going to carry my sandwich, my drink, and my apples to school without any kind of bag. But these were trials to be overcome. The interesting thing about a rite of passage is a rite of passage assumes that there's some kind of significant change taking place in an individual's life. You're moving from one place to the next. That rite of passage is about beginning to understand who you are in your neighborhood, who you are in your community, who you are in the world. And I want to suggest here that walking to school is an important part of children learning to, in fact, become autonomous adults. So that's reason number one. Reason number two is a bit of a zinger, so I just want to warn you before it goes up on the screen. Uh, because it's not so pleasant and we don't like to talk about it, but the reality is that childhood obesity isn't fair. And as walking has decreased, obesity has significantly increased. Children who are obese are four times more likely to be obese as adults. Think about that for a minute. Obesity is linked to significant health issues, 
to shorter lifespans. These are important reasons for us to take obesity seriously. But think about it from the child's perspective. What's the biggest impact to a child of being obese? Well, it's going to be more difficult to participate in the day-to-day -day -day activities taking place at school. But the biggest impact is really psychological. Do you remember being teased as a child? And we don't like to talk about childhood obesity. It sounds like a judgment. It sounds a bit too personal. We shouldn't really go there. But what if it's a national health issue? What if childhood obesity is fundamentally affecting the quality of life of our children and their future quality of life? There's good data on this stuff. Children who walk to school are more likely to walk to be active throughout the day at school. Children who walk to school have lower BMI, Boss Maddie Index scores, the amount of fat that's measured on their bodies. It's significantly lower if children, in fact, walk to school. In Canada, only 12% of children are getting the daily dosage of 90 minutes a day of physical activity. Only 12%. If walking to school could have an impact on that number, could even make a bit of a dent in it and push it a little bit upwards, why wouldn't that be something that we would, in fact, want to embrace? So that's reason number two. Reason number three is really about the way that we live in the world. It's about shrinking our footprint. And this is really about our environmental imperative. And it may sound a little bit self-evident, but what I want to talk about here is active modes of transportation. This is throwing some planning lingo in there. As planners, when we talk about active transportation, we're talking about ways of moving from one place to another using our bodies as our primary means of movement. So walking, running, cycling, rollerblading, anything that doesn't involve a fossil fuel. Now, in the early 80s, there was a planner based in Vancouver, BC, named Dr. Will Reese who came up with a tool to assess the impact that each one of us has on the Earth. This was called environmental footprint analysis. And what Dr. Reese realized is that most of us are consuming significantly more than the Earth can bear, and we're producing much more waste than the Earth can assimilate. And what was so interesting about the work that he did was he looked at each individual and figured out a way that on an individual basis you could go home and you could look at the things you do, the things you eat, the food you eat, what you consume, and you could calculate what your footprint is, how much earth is required to support your lifestyle. So for example, one of the things we know as a result of this analysis is that in a developing country, it takes approximately a third of a hectare to support one individual. In North America, you can imagine the number is obviously much higher. It takes between eight and 10 hectares to support each individual. And it varies depending on how consumptive each one of us are. So Dr. Reese, having done this analysis, realizing that yes, we're heading for global catastrophe, we're taking more than we should, and we're putting much more junk back into the earth than the earth can possibly assimilate, came up with one solution. And his solution was, we need to live more simply at a very basic level. What could be more simple than strapping on your shoes and walking to school? Walking to school is not the entire solution to our environmental crisis, but it can serve to shrink our footprint on an individual basis. And this, in fact, really matters. This is an important reason why we should, in fact, be walking to school. So I've talked a little bit about some of the reasons why walking to school matters. And at the end of the day, it's pretty straightforward. You don't need to go buy something to walk to school. Cities don't need to be completely rebuilt, although as planners, we can plan for walking and we can plan higher density neighborhoods that encourage walking in a more substantive way. And lastly, you don't need permission to walk to school. You don't need to get a license. You can just walk out the door and do it tomorrow, right? It's pretty straightforward. Well, this is where I came to a problem in my planning practice. Because you see, I have children. And I have, I have a 12-year-old daughter. And a couple of years ago, I decided that it was pretty important to tackle this issue of walking to school with my daughter. 
And um, just to set the stage for you, there she is. Her name's Alexandra. She's right in, the, right in the center there. I thought she was kind of waving at everybody, but she told me when I showed her this presentation, she said, no, no, Mom, I'm high-fiving. Uh, Alexandra and I sat down to have a talk about walking to school, and this is the very first thing that Alexandra had to say about walking to school. Like, forget it, Mom, it's way, way too far. There's just absolutely no way. So I scratched my head and I thought, well, it is sort of far. And then I thought, hold on a minute. I walked to school. How far was my walk to school? Being an inherently competitive person, I dragged Alexandra over to the computer and I said, kid, let's map our walks to school. I actually think my walk to school was significantly longer than your walk to school. And if I did it, heaven knows you can do it too. Not that much has changed, in fact. So that's what Alexandra and I did. And you see there the H is for my house and the S is where my school was. And lo and behold, my walk to school was 2.7 kilometers. Now, this is just on the threshold of being a bit too far. Over three kilometers, typically, the numbers go very, take a deep dive in terms of how many kids will, in fact, walk to school. But I can tell you, I did that walk to school, and you heard the story about the apples rolling onto the sidewalk. I did it there, and I did it back, and I didn't actually ask questions. I didn't really think that I had an option, um, and maybe that's why I'm such an autonomous adult. Who knows? So let's look at Alexandra's walk to school. There's our house, and some things have changed. You can see here, we're in a much denser urban neighborhood, which is good for walking to school. And here's Alexandra's walk, 1.9 kilometers to school. So you know what this meant? This was like good news, bad news. This was great news for me, and really bad news for Alexandra, because I said, kid, it's not too far. I know, I'm living proof, I'm a relic of the past, it's not too far. I did it, you can do it too. Well, immediately what happened, when we determined that distance wasn't a problem, two other issues came up. A whole series of what I kind of lumped in as fact-based reasons why she couldn't walk to school, and then a bunch of what I called fear-based reasons. And really what we did was we sat down at the table, we both agreed, Alexandra agreed that there were th those three Three reasons were really important reasons for her to be walking to school. So we began to identify what some of the reasons, other reasons might be. We'd already decided it wasn't too, too far. Then there were some fear-based reasons, and quite frankly, we did not know what to do with those. So we just left those on the table. The fact that she was tired. It's gonna, at the end of the day, I'm too tired to walk home, Mom. Okay, so you're going to have to get to bed earlier, and we're going to have to make sure you've got good, nutritious snacks in your backpack that you can eat on the way home. What about getting to after-school programs? Well, we made a strategic decision as a family. No more after-school programs that are not within walking distance of the school. More fear-based reasons came up. What about the fact that no one else walks? Now, I have to admit, this was the biggest reason for me, because having a child on the sidewalk, children walking down the street, it, it humanizes an environment. We all watch what's going on, we drive a little bit more slowly when we see children on the sidewalk. So my problem was, well, she's gonna be the only kid in this neighborhood where everyone else is driving to school. We really didn't know how to solve that one other than beginning to look for other kids who might be willing to walk to school as well. And it's difficult to do things differently than the culture that you're in. But we also decided to get her a cell phone as a safety precaution because she was going to be walking that 1.9 kilometers alone. Her bag is too heavy. Every, day, every morning we prune her bag and every evening we prune her bag. No extra junk. Have you noticed the huge packs kids carry today? It's because they're not walking to school. If they were walking to school, they would have smaller, smaller bags. What became very clear in going through these facts-based reasons and the fear-based ones is that the fact-based ones we could be creative and solve. And the fear-based ones, well, you know what? There really wasn't anything we could do about those. We just had to decide as a family that we were not too prepared to enter the world based on fear. So we said, you know what? Screw all those fear-based reasons. We're going to address the things that we can address, and we're going to go out boldly walking to school. What became clear to us is it's choice, actually, to walk to school. And there's a whole series of strategies. I told you a few of the ones that we used at our house. But also just walking some of the time, not all the time. Walking maybe only home from school, not to school. The walking school bus where parents in the neighborhood come together and they walk each other's kids to school. Maybe dropping kids off near the school 
not necessarily right at the school, there's still that opportunity for autonomy. That's still that opportunity for getting some exercise before school, just dropping children off part of the way. What became very clear in going through this exercise with Alexandra is that very, very evidently, in one generation, we've completely shifted from being a society where children walk to school to being a society where children are driven to school. We shifted it in one generation, and guess what? We can, in fact, shift it back. I want to suggest that walking to school is in fact a simple, hopeful, powerful act. It is an indicator of what we believe and what it is that we value. It's also an indicator of where we choose to live or sometimes where we can afford to live. It's an indicator of the health of our children, the health of our environment, the health of our communities. I would like to suggest that we need to re-embrace walking to school because there are some not-so-frivolous reasons that demand it of us. Can we take steps to walk to school? And I have a bonus slide for you here, and it's this. That's Alex walking to school yesterday. Thank you. <laughs>